G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I've got an exciting tutorial where I'm going to jump around quite a few pieces of software just to tackle a common design challenge, which is dealing with randomized and cellular facade designs. Uh, first of all, we'll look at randomization, then we'll look at image-driven facades. But the thing that's going to make this tutorial special today is I'm going to do it in Dynamo, Grasshopper, and finally Rhino Inside Rabbit. Um, so quite a fun tutorial, and the goal really here is to show uh, viewers of the channel or of the video uh, how these platforms look to run, their similarities, their differences, and of course their benefits as well. So we'll go from a fairly simple workflow to begin with in Dynamo, and finally end up in a relatively complex one in Rhino Inside Rabbit. Now, of course, uh, these platforms are very different to each other and they go very well together. Uh, but the point I'll show is that, you know, you can create a very simple solution in Dynamo with maybe some limitations, but you can also create a complex solution in Rhino inside Revit. But of course, it's going to be harder for the user to create and pilot. Um, so it'll be an interesting tutorial, I think. Um, so today I'll be in Revit 2024 and Rhino 7, probably Rhino 8 will come to the channel quite soon. Um, and I'll be using the inbuilt versions of Dynamo and Grasshopper that come with them. And of course, Rhino Inside Revit as well, which you can download from the Rhino Inside Revit website. So of course it will help if you have some background in Revit, Rhino and these platforms, but I will try to explain as we go roughly what I'm doing as well. So without further ado, I'll jump right in. Of course, if I speak too fast, uh, feel free to slow me down using the YouTube playback speed as always. Um, but I'm going to begin in Revit. Um, so we're gonna just jump straight into Revit and I've set up a model here uh, with some curtain panels and just a curtain wall. So I have four special curtain panels I've built especially for this tutorial. A black panel called CP0 black, uh, a panel called CP1 gray, CP2 gray two, which is slightly lighter. And finally, a panel that's almost white. And we're gonna play with these four shades of color in order to uh, create a facade that responds in this case to either images or complete randomization. So let's actually just take this facade wall and jump straight into Dynamo. So to begin with, uh, we're just gonna approach this from a purely randomized perspective. Um, we wanna take one panel or every panel in a curtain wall and randomize the types of panels that are being used from a select list of panels specifically. So I'm gonna make a new script and just quickly save uh, this script as well. So I'm gonna begin by selecting a model element using select model element and pick this curtain wall. Now at this point, I do want to get the curtain panels on the elements. So there's a node called curtain panel by element in Revit 2024, which should return all the panels that are supported by this curtain wall. And I can see I've instantly just retrieved the 40 panels on the curtain wall. Now I'm just gonna maximize at this point for a while while we actually randomize these panel types. What I wanna do now is know how many panels I'm dealing with, and I'm gonna generate a random number for each of them. So I'm gonna use the list count node to find out how many panels there are here, which in this case we can see there is 40. And I'm also just gonna be using a random list of numbers. And I do want to use one that has a seed so I can cycle and change the distribution of the values so that I can experiment with the design outcome and try different things out. So in this case, I want this many elements and I'm going to put them between, in this case, uh, zero and three. I mean, sorry, zero and one, <laughs> of course, what am I doing? Zero and one. And we're just gonna create a seed value. In this case, I'm just gonna plug it into an integer slider. And I'm just gonna say that we begin at zero, go to 100, step of one, no worries, let's do that. So for each panel, we should now have a random value between zero and one. Now let's go just down here, and I'm just gonna get the family types drop down, and we're just going to pick, in this case, uh, those system panels, which you'll find down under system panels. And we'll do them from darkest to lightest. So we've got black, CP1, CP2, and CP3. Or CP3 white. And we're just going to do a list create and just put these four panel types in a list together. And what we wanna do is randomly pick one of these for each panel in the model. So we already have a random number between zero and one, but now we actually want to convert this to an index for this list. 
So I'm going to count the number of objects in this list so that the script is technically dynamic. So if I add more panel types further back in the script, it's still going to be able to pick from the overall list of these panels later. So we have four panels at the moment. So I'm going to multiply this by the random number. Now we do have a problem at this point in that some of these values will be more than three, but we're dealing with a list of four objects. So the largest index we want is actually three and the lowest is actually zero. So what we actually want to do is round down these values using a floor. And now we should have values ranging from zero to three. And we can see we have zero, one, two, and three, which can actually be used to index this list of panels by index. So I'm going to use a get item at index node and from this list of panels, I'm going to get the randomized panel at those indices. And we now have a random family type per panel. Finally, I'm going to set the parameter by name and I'm going to take my original curtain panels and I'm going to, in this case, just target the type parameter because we want to set the type of these panels. I'm now going to plug in to the value these panel types and we can see that instantly because I was in automatic mode we've actually just randomized this wall. We can actually pick different seeds and we'll see that we get different outcomes and we can see I can move it pretty quickly because it's a very small script and we have the ability to cycle and play with this wall and because we're dealing with the curtain wall as our input if this gets bigger our script will take this into account and can adjust and pick up the fact that this wall has more or less panels. So we can see we very quickly were able to create a, a purely random outcome that still aligns to our curtain panels from a type basis. So we're still preserving the fact that these are objects. This is BIM. Uh, we still care about scheduling these objects by color. So we need to know how many we actually need to order. Um, so it's a fairly robust little workflow if you're trying to achieve a randomized facade outcome. Now let's jump over to Rhino now that we've solved this one and have a look at a different way of going about this problem. So I'm gonna minimize Revit for now. We'll, we'll come back there later. Let's jump into Rhino instead. So in this case, we're going to be really doing the same thing, but just in Rhino. Now, the first difference obviously is that we don't have a Revit model or elements. So we actually need to create geometry in our script. There are lots of ways to do this. You could model all the panels manually, or you could generate them computationally, which is what we're gonna do here. So I'm just going to create, in this case, a new script, save it, just call it test for now. And in this case, I'm just going to begin by making a rectangle. And I'm just in uh, millimeters at the moment, I believe. If not, I'll make sure that I am. There we go. And to begin with, uh, just from the origin in Rhino, I'm going to create a domain from 0 to 1000. So I'm just going to type that in a panel with two forward slashes which is just a really quick way to write a domain, which will create a rectangle from zero to 1000 in the X and Y direction. From here, I'm gonna to wanna to plug this into a rectangular array. So a two directional array. And I'm gonna plug in this case, this geometry in, and the cell is going to be the geometry so that it repeats to the same, same layout as the cell itself. Let's just maybe create a 10 and 10 X and Y count. And we now have a very quick uh, computationally generated grid of panels. And that's, I'm just gonna patch them into a surface. And now we have some 2D elements and we're just going to override their appearance. Now we're gonna use the same logic again. Instead of list count in Grasshopper, we have list length, but it's effectively the same thing. The randomization node is a little bit more friendly in Grasshopper, it is a little bit more intuitive. If you provide a range of values, which is defaulted from zero to one, how many you want, which I'll plug in here, and also a seed as well. So I'll say zero, uh, maybe uh, one to 100. So you can write a slider very quickly by using that notation. And that will give me a slider from zero to 100, starting at one, so there we go. And at this point, we're generating random values between zero and one like before. The next thing I'm going to do is instead of using family types, I'm going to be mapping colors along a gradient. So I'm gonna use the gradient node, and I'm gonna set the preset from white to black. In this case, I can choose how many steps I want to take across that gradient. So in this case, I'll use a slider, starting at one, uh, sitting at five, up to 10 steps. And then I'm going to, in this case, plug in a domain, in this case to T, which will tell this, uh, this node to provide me with that many uh, increments along here. 
So I'm going to use a range in order to create those steps. So I'm going to say I want five objects from zero to one. And we can see now I have those steps along that domain, which will return those colors. And we can see we go from white through to black. And so we now have a dynamically scalable set of colors. I'm going to multiply in this case, the number of colors we wanted times the value. And again, I'm going to floor that outcome using the round node, which contains the round, the floor and the ceiling, which goes rounds up. So we're going to be using the floor. And again, I'm going to use the list item, which is effectively the get item at index node in Grasshopper. And from my list of colors at those indices of the floors, I now have my random values and I can now use what's called a custom preview. Now this won't bake in the geometry to Rhino, but it will preview it very quickly. So we'll take our geometry by the colors, hide the surfaces, and there we go. We can see we've achieved pretty much the same outcome again with a very quick randomization seed available. I can add more or less colors to make it more dynamic. So I can see if I only have two or three, we end up with less colors. And then as I increase the number of colors, obviously the in input gets more dynamic. If I want to make this even more interesting, I can manipulate the base domain of zero to one so that I actually start later or earlier on the gradient scale from white to black. So for example, I can construct a domain, which is zero to one by default, but let's say we want to raise that bottom threshold. And slowly but surely, we're going to make our colors darker because we're starting earlier along our gradient. So we can see that Grasshopper does offer us a little bit more color and gradient control. There are some really great components that it does feature. So what if we want to get a little bit more of that control in Revit? Well, one really good option is we can use Rhino inside Revit to effectively combine the power of both of these tools together to still get a BIM based outcome using a highly powerful parametric and computational design engine from Grasshopper. So this is where it gets really fun. So at this point, I'm just gonna be closing Grasshopper, closing Rhino as an application, but going back to Revit and booting up Rhino inside from inside there. So I'm gonna to go to Rhino inside, start Rhino inside Revit, which is really cool. I always love doing that. We're still gonna be targeting these curtain panels, but we're gonna to have to collect them in a more inefficient manner because there isn't quite the same nodes in Dynamo. And that's immediately one challenge that Rhino Inside will bring you. Um, unless you know GH Python or the Revit API and Python within Rhino Inside, you will be slightly limited uh, by the more limited selection of tools available in Rhino Inside for some of these more advanced workflows. Having said that, there are still a lot of great nodes in Rhino Inside, but you may occasionally find something in Dynamo isn't in Rhino Inside Revit as it comes. So you will immediately hit that as a limitation to some degree. Anyway, I'm just gonna zoom out. Um, in this case, I'm in millimeters in Revit and I should be in millimeters in Rhino. So I'm just making dead sure I'm in the right units. I'm gonna boot up Grasshopper inside Rhino, inside Revit. Always love saying that. And we're just gonna start playing around with a slightly more advanced toolkit that takes advantage of all of these things that we've just done. So the first thing we need to do is actually collect all the curtain panels visible in our active view. So in Rhino Inside, we do that using the filtering system to create a condition and then retrieve the elements that meet those conditions. If you know the Revit API, you'll be familiar with filtered element collectors. And this is effectively a toolkit that constructs them for you. It's pretty cool. So we're gonna filter based on two conditions, the category of the element and can I see it in the current view? So in this case, I'm going to be looking for a category filter and I'm also gonna be looking for a visible in view filter. The view that we want is the active view. So we're looking for the active view node. If you're ever not sure where these nodes come from, hold down control, alt and left click, and it's gonna to point to it. So that's not me drawing on the screen. That's what it actually looks like. It's nice and graphical, but it will very quickly take you to where these nodes are. If it needs to expand the menu, it will. Very cool. You'll know that you're about to do it because you'll see that little eye icon pop up before you click. For the category node, I'm just gonna look for category. And for now, I'm just gonna pick the category from this list inside the default categories node. There are other ways to get the category, a little bit cleaner than that, but this one's quite nice from a real, real estate and screen size perspective that it takes up. So now that we have these two filters, we need to combine them using a logical and filter, which means that it must pass both of these conditions. 
The next thing we do is form an element query or a query elements, which are basically applies a filter and retrieves those elements. And I am going to take off the L by zooming in. I can activate the ZUI or the zoomable user interface. I'm going to remove the limits so that we don't limit it to hundred elements. And at this point, uh, we will actually have Revit elements within, within Rhino in the context of Grasshopper. We can't currently see them, and that's because we do need to ask to see their geometry. So I might just make this a little bit bigger. I might just actually put this over here. That is the hard thing in Rhino inside. The screen space can get a little bit limited. Um, it is good if you have more than one screen, but not for YouTube. So element geometry will actually show us these elements, and there they are. So we now have our curtain panel geometry. Pretty cool. From here, I'm, I'm also going to be asking for their location. So we want the element location. And in the case of these curtain panels, it's going to return a few things for me. Um, first of all, we do have the elements again. I am going to turn off this preview, but I'll be focusing in this case on the location points, which are the, in this case are at the bottom front center of the curtain panels. And we're going to use these to assess where on a combined surface these panels actually occur. Because currently they're very much out of order in the model. So we do need to get ourselves back in some degree of control of understanding where these occur on an overall surface together. We don't quite have the same degree of context when we have to actually structure the order of these curtain panels. Now we're not going to go random and that's why the order is actually quite important. So in this case I'm going to take these points and I'm going to create a bounding box around them and I'm going to create a union box around these. And that's going to give me a 3D box that encompasses all those points. Now, of course, this only really works because those points in this case are actually orientated to the Y axis, but you could get the facing orientation of one of these panels in order to rotate the aspect of the bounding box you're using, which can be input as a plane input. But for now, we're going to keep things simple. So I do want to get, in this case, the largest possible face of the bounding box, which will be one of the big surface faces that I actually am interested in dealing with. So I'm going to deconstruct BRAP, which will actually just basically give me all the faces, edges, components of this box. So now I should have six faces. So how do I get the biggest face out of all of this? Well, technically there's going to be two biggest faces, the front and the back. And I really don't mind which one I get, in all honesty. Um, I can work with the domains after. So I'm going to ask these faces for their area. And now I want to find the one that's got the biggest area. So in order to deal with this, I'm going to use a sort list node. And the keys that I'm providing will be the areas and the attributes or the objects that I'm sorting by those keys or values um, will in this case be the original surfaces. They're going to sort from lowest to highest. So I want to get the last item in the lists that we sorted. So I'm going to look for the index of negative one, which represents the first object from the back of the list or the last object. And I can see now that I've successfully isolated one of the largest faces in this bounding box, which I can now assume will let me assess where these points occur on that surface. Now, the way I can do this is using the closest point to surface node or surface closest point. I'm going to make sure that I'm reparameterizing my surface so that I'm assessing it within its own domain of zero to one in the U and the V direction. And in this case, I'm going to be taking all these points and asking, so, sorry, all of these points and saying, where do you occur on the surface? Now, most of them will basically be on the surface, but the good thing about this is it's going to return a UV value between zero and one, which is basically the vertical and horizontal position of where these points occur. And we can actually line this up to an image using an image sampler. So this is a really good input for this workflow. For now, I'm just going to turn off those preview points. We're going to start dealing with the UVs instead. And I'm going to be calling on Grasshopper's image sampler. I'm just going to double click it. We're going to be looking at the color brightness. And in this case, I'm just going to bring in a black and white image. Uh, let's just begin by bringing in the Mona Lisa in black and white. So I'm going to be bringing in the UV points, which will assess the image in the horizontal and the vertical pixel locations of the image that we have here. I'm then going to actually take this from one to invert the outcome. And now we've got effectively at each point the curtain panel would sit at, it now has some context of if it was this image, 
what value would it want between zero and one based on the brightness of this image? I'm just gonna save before I forget. That's probably a good idea. So what we need to do now is go back a step and actually get our curtain panels and their types so that we can map them to these values. But right before I do, I'm just gonna very quickly visualize what's happened in the context of Grasshopper. So I'm gonna make a gradient using these values as the, the T domain, which will give me a list of colors at that position along this domain. And I can just do a very quick custom preview to make sure that these colors, if applied to the geometry of these panels, would correlate to the image. So I'm just going to hide a few inputs here and just make sure this is actually working. Um, it doesn't quite look right. I think I need to flatten this list. There we go. And maybe let's make this a little bit bigger in Revit so it's closer to the aspect ratio of the picture. And we'll see that we should end up with an outcome that is fairly coincident with the image. And there we go. We can see, I'll just hide this input. And we basically have a fairly good but very pixelated image, of course, that represents the, the Mona Lisa picture on the facade. Now, of course, these colors uh, are gonna be more than four types. They're gonna fall outside the domain of the four colors in Revit that we want these to become. So our next step is to get those four panel types and then move them to the nearest type that represents that shade of black or white that they should represent. So we're just gonna probably just do a little bit of cleanup first. So we have filters, I'm gonna group them. We have some geometry, we're gonna group that. We get the smallest face. Again, I'm gonna group that, just hide this, and I'm just also gonna assess my image. Now we're gonna go down here and start assessing our family types. So firstly, I need my system panel family. So curtain panels are a bit different to normal families. They are a system family, but they belong to the overarching family called system panel. So I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to be looking for curtain panels and in this case the system panel family. And I can now ask this family for its types using the query types node which is just over there. So in this case I'm fitting in the category. Now at this point we're going to have a, uh, whoa, way too many types. That's not the one, that's not the node I want. I want a different one. I actually want the family types node, that's much better. We are gonna have a few too many types from the model. So we can see we've got those CP uh, families, which are great, but we don't want the other system panels because we don't wanna use them. So in this case, I'm gonna filter them out by asking for their element name. And we're gonna look at these names and we're gonna feed these into a text match check, which is going to check in this case, if this name contains a regex or a pattern. In this case, I'm just gonna be asking, do you contain CP? And if you do, we should get a true. If you don't, we should get a false. And we'll see that we get those four trues at the end of our list. And we can apply this to what's called a cull pattern. In the context of Dynamo, you might be used to that being a filter by Boolean mask. This is a little bit like a filter by Boolean mask, only it doesn't give you the false outcome. There's another node in Grasshopper called Dispatch, which is effectively filter by Boolean mask with the in and the atlas, in this case being called A and B. But this will just leave me with only the four curtain panel types that I'm most interested in. Now I can also sort uh, these as well, which I probably should. So I'm in this case going to just get the element name again. And I want to, in this case, use the sort text node. So we can sort by text as well. The value is gonna be the panels and in this case, the key is going to be the names of the panels. And we can see now we've sorted from CP0 through to CP3 uh, from the darkest to the lightest panel possible. So now that we've done uh, this, uh, next, we actually probably want to reverse the list because remember the top of our gradient is actually black and the bottom of our gradient is actually white at the moment. So it's very easy to do that. You can just use a reverse list node to flip all the elements in this case, the values. So we now go from darkest at the front to lightest at the back. We also need to now figure out, so I'm just gonna make that another group. We need to figure out how these values line up to the values that we're really targeting. So we're gonna come back a step to here. And what we wanna do now is remap these numbers. So we're gonna use the remap numbers node. 
We're taking these in and we know that their source domain is zero to one. We're now gonna to wanna to target a domain of the length of the number of objects minus one. So I'm just gonna, in this case, take a list length and say, how many curtain panel types do we have? Minus one, because remember, we're using a zero based indexing system. So we have to go back to zero as our lowest. And you can actually plug in numbers to domains in Grasshopper and it will just tell the domain to be zero to the number you give it. So it's a nice little shortcut. So we can see this is now zero to three, uh, remapped from zero to one. And at this point, we should now have uh, these numbers nicely remapped. Um, we do want to also just round them because in this case, we can't index by a decimal number and we can just work with the rounded outcome. So we should expect to see, uh, they're all zeros at the moment, which isn't correct. So we actually don't, Ah, oh, sorry, the source, That's the, that should be the target domain. So this is actually the source domain of zero to one, remapped to zero to three. So now we should see values, hopefully from zero to three, occurring in this list. And of course, there we, we, we've got them. Cool, too easy. So I'll just break this out. And now we effectively have uh, this thing we can use as a list item indexer. So I'm gonna take the rounded outcome as the index, and the list, again, is going to be my outcome, which is those panel types. So we've sort of created the same logic that we used when we were in Dynamo, now in Rhino inside, but we're now using an image as the basis for these values, rounded to the nearest color, because our panels are in order of the color gradient that we're using. The last thing we need to do is actually set the type of these panels like we did before. So if I go to element and I get the element parameter node, this node can do a few things. It has the ability to take the value out to ask for values, but if we keep the V input, it's going to act like a set parameter value by name node from Dynamo. So in this case, I do want to get my original panels all the way back here, which are still in order of their position. And I'm now going to ask for the type parameter by name. And finally, I'm just going to feed those values, which are going to be types. When the node goes black, that shows that it's run. Um, I can also just quickly go and try potentially reversing these. No, I think I forgot to actually feed the reverse list in here. And there we go. We can see that Revit is picking up a remapped set of these. And we can really see the impact. If we make this wall larger, it is gonna make the model slower. But right on side is going to keep up with this quite comfortably. It's definitely slower than in Grasshopper, but it's about the same speed as in Dynamo, maybe slightly slower. And check it out, we're getting a remapped range of panels in, in line, roughly, with the image in the model. Very cool. Depending which side of the wall we're on, we'll see different outcomes. Now you can create a more diverse gradient of color, but of course you'll need more types in Revit across that spectrum of color that you'd like to line them up to. And because this is an image sampler, I can very quickly just pick another image as reference, and it's able to respond almost instantaneously to the change. Uh, so we can see that we've created a, a very powerful outcome, taking advantage of the fact that we are still in a BIM and a parametric based environment where we can still go and produce and document and schedule this system, but we're in a very powerful parametric and computational engine in Grasshopper where we've got access to a lot more advanced tools and features that weren't necessarily in Dynamo quite the same way, um, and as a result, we've been, able, we've been able to create a very powerful but complex outcome. So I hope it's been an interesting demonstration of the ways that you can approach these problems using these engines or combining them if you so choose. Um, but of course, Rhino Inside obviously takes more work. It's a little bit more work to get someone to run it. Um, and it's obviously gonna be something that you wanna practice a bit more before you run it. Dynamo is a bit easier. Up is sort of a middle ground, um, but it doesn't really get back to Revit. But then Rhino Inside enables us to get back to Revit as well to sort of close the loop in the whole equation. Um, so hopefully that was an interesting uh, demonstration and you've learned a little bit along the way. Um, you'll be able to find the scripts from this video and other videos, uh, obviously, uh, on, on, from my channel on my GitHub. So feel free to check that out. Um, I hope you found the, the topic interesting. I definitely enjoyed putting it together because I love using these platforms, especially together. Um, and feel free to leave any comments, queries, requests down below. Um, I look forward to seeing a lot of you in future similar videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you.